Um, so I'd like to, from behalf of the journal, once again, thank you for contributing to the issue on old age psychiatry and also for encouraging the distinguished president of the WPA to write a special note. And maybe you can just tell us about your experience as a guest editor for our journal and the idea to create an issue on this particular um, topic. Yeah, thank you, Maria. Thanks for uh, you know <clears throat> organizing this discussion. And uh, let me take this opportunity to thank the consortium psychiatric team, you know, your entire editorial team, um, chief editor, Dr. George, and uh, Dr. Olga Kapenko, and all of you. Uh, Elena, the editorial assistant, for making this possible, this issue possible. That's that's uh, you know a, a very important. I think it's a teamwork. And uh, uh, the idea of this issue came first when um, I was uh, listening to Dr. Olga present about uh, one of the issues of consortium psychiatricum in uh, the last 2020 World Psychiatric uh, Association Congress. I was also a presenter there myself and uh, when I, when I heard her present and when I had a look at the issue, then I went back to the website and I found it very interesting that it was a very young journal and uh, it's doing pretty well. Uh, the issues, what, what I found was quite much thematic based on uh, different authors across the globe, different topics in psychiatry. And uh, it was fairly new. I think at that time there were only uh, journal was running for a year and a half. Uh, so uh, that's how it all started. So I thought that why not we have a special issue on old age psychiatry, uh, geriatric psychiatry, because this is an area which is very niche and not really covered in many general psychiatry journals. And uh, that was the start of a process. I uh, contacted Dr. Carpenko and then we had, uh, you know, uh, a detailed correspondence over quite some time. Uh, we kind of thought of, uh, uh, we kind of made an idea about the issue and what it's going to cover. Um, what are the topics, what are the subtopics in old age psychiatry that we plan to cover? And I, even that day, I didn't know that it's going to materialize so well with all our efforts, that it's going to come ahead in print today. And, uh, I think it was a wonderful experience for me uh, as an early career psychiatrist, as an editor of other journals. I think it was a great learning experience for me because um, I look at it through the lens of being a geriatric psychiatrist myself. Um, somebody early in my career in the field of mental health and of course as an editorial experience. Uh, there are three, four aspects to it that I would like to highlight. One is reaching out to eminent figures across the globe, like as you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, the distinguished president, Dr. Afzal Javid from the WPA, Dr. Carlos, the chair of the section of old age psychiatry, uh, who has again contributed a very important policy article and was very excited about the issue. Uh, Dr. Kiran Rabiru, uh, he's the chair of the steering group of the ILC and also the chair of the advocacy and public awareness committee of the International Psychogeriatric Association of which I'm also a part of. And of course, researchers from other parts of, you know, from Russia, from India, uh, from other countries. Uh, and it, it was interesting discussing with them about the prospect of an independent issue which is solely focused on old age psychiatry, something which will be helpful for clinicians as well as for researchers who are interested in this field. And uh, not to mention the editing experience, because I, I think your team was fantastic. They helped me in every possible aspect. Dr. George was extremely encouraging and uh, uh, we could 
uh, you know, uh, collaborate with the authors throughout the period. We kind of had a timeline of six months and uh, the issue was on time. We managed to have uh, around 12, 13 articles, including original research policies, editorials, reviews, and uh, I'm glad I could contribute to it as an author myself as well. And I think this will really, really serve as food for thought in having separate issues on uh, geriatric psychiatry uh, again, and also on other thematic issues uh, with consortium psychiatry. Uh, it was uh, it was a wonderful experience that I look forward to again. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. It's a truly multi-dimensional work. I've been reading it myself. The you know these days to create some descriptions for the website and it's truly admirable i think what you did all of the authors that contributed and uh before we proceed to your main article uh i know that you also contributed to a couple of others on um healthy longevity among the lgbtqii plus and uh the one about the joint panel discussion maybe you could say a few words about what's what are they about what's important to know about them yeah thanks uh, maria i think uh, firstly again uh, i'm glad that i could contribute to this uh, main issue uh, you know the thematic issue on knowledge psychiatry and uh, i i was uh, once again i was really impressed by uh, the timeline, the quality of the review, the constructive review, and uh, the multiple rounds of discussions with the editorial team, which I really felt helped in enriching at least my own articles and all the articles of the issues for that matter. So as you were asking, uh, as an author, I have uh, three articles in this uh, special issue. Um, of course, the original research, as you mentioned, is uh, related to sexuality and sexual experiences in old age. Uh, the, the other two, one was a commentary which was healthy longevity among the LGBTQIA plus population from neglect to meeting their needs, which was co-authored by Dr. Henrik Pereira from Portugal. And uh, the other was a conference report which was the World Psychiatric Association, the Indian Psychiatric Society, the SARC Psychiatric Federation, and the Asian Federation of Psychiatric Associations joint panel discussion, which was organized by the IEPA, the International Psychogeriatric Association. And it was titled The Voices from South Asia Regarding Older People's Mental Health Advocacy and Services. Uh, it was jointly, uh, you know, it was co-authored by the other panelists, which again include Dr. Ramsal Javed, the president of WPA, Dr. G. Prasad Rao, the president-elect of Asian Federation of Psychiatric Societies, and the current president of Indian Association, Association of Geriatric Mental Health, Dr. Gautam Saha, the ex-president uh, of uh, Indian uh, Psychiatric Society, and the press, current president of SARC Psychiatric Federation and Dr. Sudarshan Pradhan from Nepal, who um, was the immediate past president of SARC Psychiatric Federation. So at the outset, let me extend my thanks to all my co-authors, uh, you know, for contributing uh, to this issue. And uh, to give you a brief about the first paper, uh, Healthy Longevity Among the LGBTQIA Plus Population. Now, this comes from a personal interest in sexual health and in working with the sexual and the gender minorities. So uh, I also am, uh, you know, the deputy editor of a journal called the Journal of Psychosexual Health, which is published by the SAGE. And uh, as a result of that, I do, uh, you know, interact with uh, many authors who have interests in psychosexual health and sexual medicine. So I, I thought, why don't we intersect the streams of geriatric psychiatry and sexual health, especially with regards to uh, the LGBTQIA population who age, especially in the later life. 
because that's a population which is anyway already marginalized, stigmatized, have a lot of unmet needs, which are further furthered by the COVID-19 pandemic, and especially so when they age, because aging brings in a lot of its own unique challenges, which uh, are perhaps more for this uh, you know, vulnerable population group. So what myself and Dr. Pereira tried to do was to give kind of a brief glimpse about what are the different uh, challenges, what are the different aspects that a person, uh, people aging, uh, you know, in this community face. The lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, intersex or asexual community. And there can be a lot of different challenges, including ageism, sexual stigma, self-stigma, stigma with the sexual identity, and so on. And, uh, you know, today we are, when we are talking, we are talking in the decade of the United Nations Decade of Healthy Aging, which is 2021 to 2030. And the decade enablers are combating ageism, creating age-friendly environments for all age groups, and uh, having an integrated and holistic care. So uh, in, in, in that lines, I think we this commentary discusses how as health professionals, we can optimize opportunities for physical, mental, and sexual health uh, in the LGBTQIA population, how uh, we can uh, you know, provide them with a better quality of life, and uh, how their inclusion is important uh, to make them aware of the sexual and reproductive rights, because all of these can actually promote healthy aging, which is a very important preventive and uh, promotive strategy for mental health. Coming to the conference report, uh, it was uh, something very close to my heart. In fact, this uh, discussion was a part of the last year's, uh, you know, International Psychogeriatric Association Awareness Week, uh, the Older Adults Mental Health Awareness Week, uh, which was the first time initiative that we organized last year. And uh, I should also uh, share with you that this year all, also we have the same initiative which starts on October 1st, considered the International Day for Older Persons, and it extends to 10th October, which is the World Mental Health Day. So again, uh, all of you are invited to attend the same event this year as well. And uh, it's virtual, and uh, it will be available on the IPA website. So um, That's this great. discussion... <laughs> yeah, thank you. So this, this discussion was, um, you know, initially conceptualized as a South Asian discussion, um, a, a part of the world which not only houses a significant amount of population, but also faces rapid population aging. And uh, we had all the key leaders, you know, from the SARC group, Dr. Abzal Javed himself representing WPA, as well as, you know, from one of the South Asian countries. And, um, also the other dignitaries who are the office bearers in the respective societies. So what we predominantly discussed was the, the geriatric services in this uh, area of the world, uh, you know, how the different organizations can collaborate with the gu guidance of the IPA and WPA in promoting training, uh, hand-holding with respect to uh, geriatric psychiatry, uh, what are the unique challenges that this country faces uh, with regards to population aging and mental health of older adults, and what are the way forward? And this was uh, not only a highly acclaimed discussion, but which received a very, uh, you know, positive feedback from around the world. So uh, all of us got encouraged to write down the proceedings of this discussion as a report. And uh, we thought that uh, what better than to have it published in the thematic issue on old age psychiatry. And uh, once again, I thank all the office bearers in the South Asian region to contribute to this. Uh, this event report uh, not only highlights the challenges, but also calls for an urgent collaborative action 
not only from a biomedical approach, but also focusing on human rights and dignity-based mental health care for older adults in this part of the world, which is indeed extremely important. And uh, I should also uh, mention here that we have, uh, you know, the International Psychogeriatric Association Congress coming up uh, in the month of November, again, which is available on the website. And uh, welcome to this year's old, uh, Older Adult Mental Health Awareness Program as well. We'll be having a similar South Asian discussion this time, so we look forward to the same. Thank you so much. Yeah, that sounds so promising and exciting. Um, yeah, um, that I think that brings us to the article we wanted initially to discuss, your article about sex and sexuality uh, in old age. And um, maybe you can just say what's unique about the article um, what makes it special? Why you particularly cared to just, you know, study this subject matter? Yeah, thank you, Maria. See, the thing is, uh, as I told you, that because uh, my interests are in sexual medicine as well as in uh, geriatric psychiatry. Uh, I thought that uh, let's see where these two intersect. And uh, being from India, and also as you know, just some time back, I was mentioning about South Asian countries. Mm -hmm. Sexuality in older age is always looked upon as something which is either non-existing or which is stigmatic. In fact, uh, very popular misconception considers older people as asexual which is extremely damaging to their dignity, to their privacy, to their confidentiality, and also to their sexual and reproductive rights. We all will age. And uh, sexuality is something which concerns a very important aspect of our life. Uh, sexual health is indeed necessary for uh, having a proper you know, mental health and psychosocial well-being. The first thing which is unique about the study is this is the first study conducted from not only India, but to the best of my knowledge of the Sark region, which looks into the direct lived experiences of older adults into sexuality. Uh, I'm a big fan of qualitative studies. And, uh, you know, I, I personally feel that uh, no offense to quantitative studies. Uh, of course, both have their own uh, niche and own uh, opportunities and advantages and challenges. But somehow um, uh, being trained as a qualitative researcher and spending a significant time in qualitative research, I feel there are certain things which are abstract, which are lived experiences, which are understandings of a concept in depth, which can only be achieved through a qualitative research. And especially in this area, sexuality is like pain or like motherhood is not something which you can simply uh, gauge through a scale. You know, it, it needs a detailed discussion with the participants and what better than directly bringing it to people whom you are interested in. So rather than us making a biased judgment about what they want and what they need, we thought of going to the older people themselves and trying to understand what are the challenges, how do they perceive sexuality and uh, you know, what are their unmet needs in terms of sexual health? Because as I said, it's quite a stigmatic subject even to talk about in our popular media, movies, etc. And I should thank Dr. T.S. Satnaran Rao, who is not only my mentor, but also a very important contributor in this paper and also JSS uh, University and JSS Medical College and Hospital and JSS Academy of Higher Education and Research for the ethical approval and guidance in the study process that finally this was successful and today we see it in print. Our idea was to have uh, not a very large sample size, but to go to, to certain people who are really willing to discuss their experiences 
and such studies have been conducted in different parts of the world, which has actually helped to shape policies. So, uh, you know, with this kind of framework in mind, we conducted very in-depth interviews uh, with uh, 20 participants who were aged above 60 years. And what we really were interested in looking at is how this, uh, you know, how do they perceive sexuality? How is it related to aging? How do they conceptualize sexuality with, with the changes in age, with increase in age? What meanings do it, does it uh, carry for them? Because the description, the definition of intimacy in literature changes with aging. That doesn't mean that they turn asexual, but how they want to perceive sexuality is very different. And also what are the barriers they face when they try to discuss this with healthcare professionals? Um, you know, I would like to keep this as a teaser because if I speak too much about it, probably people will not really go to the paper to read it. So uh, I'm sure that, uh, you know, and, and I really expect we, uh, I thank Con Consortium Psychiatricum again because this is an open access paper. So I believe that many will come across this and this will spark further research into this neglected area. And definitely it may uh, ring a bell in the policy makers and, you know, healthcare workers to consider this as an important area of shaping policies. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, um, I'm not a scientist myself, but I just must say how touching it was to read those bits of interviews with old people and what they shared about intimacy. And yes, I think that's, that's really important to hear what people really go through and, and feel, especially in such a field that actually studies you know, psychiatry, psychology, soul feelings, it's only, it's a very subjective. Yes. Uh, it's, it's very challenging, you know, because when you really go and that, that was really a problem in a sampling that uh, I think we managed to get these 20 uh, gentlemen and ladies with a lot of difficulties because people are not very open to discuss these issues. And one of the important themes that also came up in the paper, which made this all the more difficult was self-stigma. You know, when you really face this reaction from society, be it in movies, books, popular discourse, media discussions, you never really, uh, you know, it's a traditional kind of uh, viewing aging with something which is decaying, something which is no longer pretty, no longer beautiful, no longer attractive. And, you know, as a geriatric psychiatrist, as a as a person who has taken care of my parents, my grandparents, I feel that, you know, dignity is not something which changes with age. Uh, at least when I age, I don't want my experience to be taken totally away from me. So I think it's important that we create a world the way we like it when we age, you know, and, and that's very important. Yeah, it's something that we're all entitled with think dignity and it stays with us um, it's, it, it's not a privilege that can be granted it's something that yeah um exactly uh, thank you so much for your honest answers maybe you have some last call to you know doctors healthcare workers even policy makers in this regard because all the things you've been um telling me about today are extremely important also from a practical point of view or to understand how to help, what can be done. Yeah, I think, uh, again, with the very limited capacity that I have, let me use this forum uh, once for thanking you, uh, you know, so that this, this discussion is happening today. And, uh, you know, the the worldwide the population is aging rapidly in fact based on the world health organization estimates the number of older individuals have up 60 years is estimated to double by 2030 triple with time and just imagine in terms of sheer numbers what is going to be the population we have achieved much better control of infections which is great but probably now it's time to shift our attention to non-communicable diseases. 
no, like dementia, mental health disorders, the vascular risk factors, diabetes, hypertension, and so on. There is arthritis, chronic pain, frailty. There are so many things which affect the older persons. The first thing first, we need to battle ageism. You know, based on the recent World Health Organization global report on ageism, which was just released last year, almost 50% of individuals worldwide harbor some such sort of ageist stereotypes. Now, as I told you, you know, we will all age. That's an inevitability. So if we do not take a step today and start acting, 20 years down the line, we are not going to live in a world which we feel secure. So I think this is an urgent call to all the healthcare workers, policy makers, everybody around there, that let us be sensitive towards the care of older persons. Whenever even you're seeing them, doesn't matter in primary, secondary, tertiary healthcare level, let us be sensitive to their needs. Spend five minutes and listen to them. It's not always a proxy consultation. Think that, you know, they do have cognitive issues, sensory problems, and they have sometimes a lot to share. Loneliness, isolation, problems with communication, digital literacy are very important considerations. Nothing of these is going to change in one day. But probably if today we take a stand and we think that we'll be basing whatever interventions we have, service provisions we have in healthcare and policy geared towards older persons. If I am framing something, let me be sensitive and trying to understand that, okay, this also needs to help create an age-friendly environment. This needs to create an anti-ageist society. It's not just about a biomedical approach. I think like any other specialities, biopsychosocial approach. And then down the line, if we are sensitive to this issue, we can actually create the world into an age-friendly place. And lastly, human rights do not depend on age. So as a person, as a member of the IPA, as a vice chair of the advocacy and public awareness committee, let me join in this call for all the healthcare workers involved in geriatric and you know, older persons care, that let's call for an international United Nations convention on the older rights, on the rights of older persons. Because we need an international framework as a legal standard to prevent human rights violation in older people. I think we can no longer wait for things to get worse. COVID-19 has already shown us the high rates of elder abuse and marginalization in senior citizens. It's very important how we think, how we act. So let's start acting now. That's all that I want to say. Thank you once again for this opportunity. And I thank the entire team of Consortium Psychiatricum once again for having me here today. Thank you so much. This is so encouraging, actually. You're like a true UN General Assembly speaker <laughs> at the rostrum. Yes, um, th yeah, I think if we had more people like you, it would be a much better place. This is so comforting to hear. Yeah, there's so much hope for the elderly. No, thank you. Very, <laughs> very limited capacity, very limited capacity personally, you know. I think uh, this message needs to reach out to many people, even to the trainees, you know, who, who are being educated in medicine, nurses, other healthcare professionals, allied fields. I think it's a joint effort. You know, myself sitting here in one corner of the world has nothing to do. I, I only have something to do in my personal capacity. But if this message reads, reaches out wide and, you know, it gets snowballed with so much of tremendous efforts that the WPA, the IPA, the GAROP, the ILC are putting in, many other organizations are putting in, I'm sure that, you know, this is going to be a global collaborative effort. My work here is only as a messenger, nothing more. I think this issue is, uh, I just hope that this issue receives all the success. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I would love the honest feedback. Whoever reads the issue, we are all open to changes, improvement, correcting the mistakes. And uh, we do hope, and I'll request, uh, you know, the editorial team through you, Maria, that uh, if we can 
revisit this issue and let's say come back with a larger issue sometime down the line, uh, you know, which will have a greater impact with our lessons learned from this issue, we can work on it further. So it was a fantastic experience working with consortium psychiatricum team. And once again, thanks from my, you know, uh, uh, not only as a geriatric psychiatrist, but also as a person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.